Bishop Wesley John Gaines, an educational visionary, founded in his lifetime two of Atlanta's most important cornerstone institutions, Big Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church and Morris Brown College. These institutions profoundly shaped and continue to influence black life in Atlanta and beyond. Bishop Gaines' final resting place is located at historic Oakland Cemetery another of Atlanta's cornerstone institutions. His legacy as an innovative thinker and leader lives on in the many thousands whose lives have been forever shaped by the man whose life began in Wilkes County, Georgia on October 4, 1840. Wesley John Gaines was the seventh of 14 children born to enslaved parents, William and Louisa, in Wilkes County, Georgia. Located between Athens and Augusta in eastern Georgia, Wilkes County and its local economy relied heavily on cotton, grown and produced by enslaved labor. According to family history, Gaines and his parents were enslaved by Robert Toombs, a wealthy white planter and politician who ultimately served as the first Secretary of State for the Confederacy. Gaines was likely named for the 18th century Anglican minister and theologian John Wesley, who led the Methodist movement in the Church of England. Appalled by slavery in the British colonies, John Wesley became an abolitionist. In 1774, he published a pamphlet titled Thoughts Upon Slavery. John Wesley wrote, quote, Liberty is the right of every human creature as soon as he breathes the vital air. And no human law can deprive him of that right, which he derives from the law of nature." Anti-elitist and anti-slavery, early Methodism appealed to black men and women held in bondage. As Methodism spread into the slaveholding South, the church began to splinter over the issue of slavery. Eventually, White Southern church leaders became less willing to condemn the practice of slavery or grant black preachers and their congregations the same privileges as whites. In 1844, the church split and the Methodist Episcopal Church South was formed. In 1849, young John Wesley Gaines converted to Christianity and joined the Methodist Episcopal Church South. His older brother, William, was the local preacher. Young Wesley also felt the call to ministry, but was plagued by ill health. He was a very sickly child. Uh, the history records him as being not able to be out, so he taught himself to read. And as a result, he gained a very um, noble part of, his, of the reading uh, etiquette and learning how to say the words in the alphabet. You got to believe in your abilities, and you have to believe in yourself. That was consistent throughout my education at Morris Brown. And, and Bishop Gaines believed that even as a small boy. Maybe he overheard some of the white kids in the, the plantation reading, but he knew that if he learned how to read that something would happen. And it was a risk worth taking. Now we don't know where kids get courage from. We don't even know where we get courage from sometimes to do the things that we do. But we also know that in life, we have to learn how to take some chances. Gaines remained in Wilkes County until the Union Army moved through Georgia in 1864. As the cannons of war quieted and news of emancipation spread, Gaines and millions of other men and women celebrated their freedom. The future was bright with promise. I think that Reconstruction is one of the least explored and most fascinating and important eras of United States history, and particularly in the American South, and particularly in Atlanta, which is kind of this crucible for civil rights activism and advocacy. It's a moment when the South is being reconstructed, literally, physically, 
in terms of having been largely physically destroyed, burned in this case, um, bombed, etc., during the war. But it's also a period of time when the South is being reconstructed in terms of society and social relations and political relations and potentially even economic um, opportunity. So a lot of times when we talk about reconstruction in the American South, we talk about it as this failure, or people talk about the Civil War as a loss. Southerners were upset about the outcome of the Civil War. And I always say to people, which Southerners are you talking about? Because at least four and a half million people who were freed from enslavement did not regard this as a failure, um, were not sad that the South did not win, and were excited about this moment to reconstruct their lives, their place in society. Um, that's the milieu in which Bishop Gaines is, is not only kind of growing up, but really coming into his own um, and making decisions and building institutions uh, for African-American inclusion certainly in American society, but I would say in a bigger way, African-American agency. Wesley John Gaines was licensed to preach in 1865. At his brother William's urging, Gaines left the Methodist Episcopal Church South to join the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. In 1867, Gaines was ordained an elder in the AME Church and was later appointed pastor of Big Bethel, a position he held for two years. Gaines spent the next 12 years serving in various pastorates in Athens, Macon, and Columbus, Georgia. As he moved from church to church, Gaines was accompanied by his wife, Julia Camper Gaines. The couple had married during slavery on August 20th, 1863. Together they had one child, Mary Louise Gaines, born on December 1st, 1872. In 1881, the Gaines family would return to Atlanta and the pastorate at Big Bethel. Big Bethel was started in 1847. And the reason why that's uh, remarkable to me is it's still almost 20 years before slavery ended in the South. And of course, Georgia and Atlanta was the Deep South. So here in the Deep South, 20 years before slavery ended, then uh, slaves were allowed to start a church uh, that uh, we had different names in the beginning, but it ended up becoming Big Bethel as we went through the years. Big Bethel was known simply as Bethel or Old Bethel in the early days when the church was led by Reverend Joseph Woods. In 1866, the congregation joined the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Construction soon began on a church building at the corner of Wheat and Butler Streets, which is present-day Auburn Avenue and Jesse Hill Jr. Drive. So if you think about people who've just been enslaved and now they're coming into this city and they're founding these multiple institutions and they are mingling with one another in that process and they are building institutions together which they mutually support and they are marrying one another and they're making families with one another and they're building churches together, all of those things. In the 1880s, under Gaines's charismatic leadership, Bethel's congregation grew to 2,000 members, making it the largest black church congregation in the South. Just from the sheer numbers, you, you would have to conclude that he had this magnetic personality. He still had this tremendous magnetism of, of pulling people uh, towards the membership. So, so I think without gains, then Big Bethel doesn't grow to this prominence that it has. Uh, without gains, then then it's a much smaller, smaller impact on the, on the town and on the people. In the decades following emancipation, black churches were not only holy spaces for spiritual worship, churches like Big Bethel became the social, economic, and political centers of black life. So Big Bethel was given the title. Now this is during the height of the black church membership. But Big Bethel was given the title here in Atlanta, the Black City Hall, because everything that was supposed to happen with black folk, it had to be a meeting here to discuss it. Gaines, the faith and community leader who taught himself to read, 
encourage the role of churches in creating spaces for education. Referring to the conditions of 1909, Gaines advises that uh, Negroes can no longer be content to hold the place of an unskilled laborer. He must aspire to be a master workman to make for himself a place among the educated, trained laborers of this country. And then he encourages us to organize technical ed schools and education for our people and to follow the lead of the Honorable Booker T. Washington and make practical industrial training a prominent feature in our system of education. He believed that the people needed to be educated in order to move forward. Can't do anything without an education. The legacy of Big Bethel and Gaines' impact on Big Bethel is that we're still stressing education, that we're still sending out young people to college, that we're still supporting our black colleges, we're still supporting Morris Brown and, and the AU schools. The legacy of, of Bishop Gaines is that we're still continuing on even a um, uh, hundred years after he's died, uh, the tenets of what he, that he planted the seeds for here. One of the reasons um, that churches in particular were so important is because there weren't that many institutions. There weren't that many buildings. There weren't that many spaces. As early as 1865, the basement of Big Bethel was used as a private school for black students. And this practice continued into the 1870s. In 1878, the officers and members of Big Bethel offered the church as the site for a new Atlanta public school, which became known as the Wheat Street School. Black students were taught in the basement of the church until 1881 when the Gate City School was opened in a new building on Houston Street. That same year, at the AME North Georgia Conference, Bishop Gaines, inspired by the work of Clark College trustees, proposed the founding of Morris Brown College. Morris Brown College was founded in 1881, and it's very important time in history, um, shortly after slavery, and it's the institution that I like to call helped itself. Um, Clark College or Clark University at the time, Atlanta University, asked West, our founder, Wesley John Gaines, could they use Big Bethel Amy Church for classroom space? And as they were having the discussion, um, someone mentions, hey, you know, if we're gonna allow someone else to use our church as classroom space, why don't we just start our own school? What happened in the basement of Big Bethel uh, in 1881 was nothing less short of a miracle. And one Stuart Wiley stood up a layman said, well, if we can establish a room at Clark University, then why can't we build a school of our own? I think perhaps the most profound and most powerful statement ever uttered by one who did not have the benefit of a great education, but understood the power in educating our boys and girls. Then Bishop Gaines stood up and said, with God's help or by God's help, we will. And thus Morris Brown College, as we would come to know it, was born. It's the institution that was started by African-Americans for African-Americans. And what's also very important that really different, differentiates the institution is that it was funded by African Americans shortly after slavery. Morris Brown College joined three other black colleges in Atlanta, Atlanta University, Clark College, and Morehouse. These sites of higher education played a significant role in the education of thousands of black students. In many cases, the graduates of these institutions stayed in the city and contributed to the development of Atlanta as a thriving urban center with abundant opportunities in business, professional, and cultural life. In Atlanta in particular, there was this phenomenon, it continues to be a phenomenon, that we refer to as the brain gain. So we talk about this in lots of cultures um, as well in different contexts where people come into cities that have colleges and universities and they stay after they've finished and they contribute to the culture there. They build businesses there. They, um, they produce 
knowledge and, and service in professional life. That was certainly the case for Atlanta, but kind of, you know, in an amplified measure because it's the largest um, grouping of such institutions um, in, in the world. Um, and so that's really important. And that brings also connections to people from different parts of the nation who are coming to study there and now really people from different parts of the world. People ran to, to exercise agency over their lives in really meaningful and important ways. And the things that they identified as key to that were economic development, education certainly, um, and in a kind of social structure where they could feel at a minimum safe, um, if not fully included in white society, to have the opportunity to build their own communities in ways that were affirming. In 1885, Gaines was elected a bishop, becoming the 16th presiding prelate of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Bishop Gaines continued to serve as an advocate for the education of black men and women. He published several works that discussed education, including African Methodism in the South, or 25 Years of Freedom in 1890, The Negro and the White Man in 1897, and The Condition and Education of the Negro in 1909. I know for a fact that Bishop Gaines had to be openly outspoken because of the things that, he was, that was said, that he said that it was documented, and the fact that he was running with the top, he was running Booker T. Washington, uh, he was running with um, Turner, he, he, he was with Douglas W.B. Du Bois. You can see that he was not shy, that he was openly and willing to say to the people, there's a problem here. Uh, have we addressed it? What do we need to do about it? How do we embrace it? And he was futuristic in what he wrote, but he left a legacy of information and roadmaps so that we can become better people if we just kind of listen and read and see what he has said. Bishop Wesley John Gaines died on January 12, 1912. Following an elaborate funeral service at Big Bethel, featuring music provided by the Morris Brown College Glee Club, Bishop Gaines was laid to rest at historic Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. So the day that I was named president of Morris Brown, I felt the need to come back and give my respects to our founder. And it was my first time ever visiting Oakland uh, Cemetery. And as soon as I walked on, I just felt a sense of peace. You know, it was very interesting because I'd never been to a cemetery where folks were picnicking and walking and exercising. I'd never seen that before. And so just walking around, it felt like a sense of peace. And then when I came to the African-American burial grounds, I went on the entire tour. And of course, I came to our, our founder's gravesite. And it, I, stood, I stayed out here for 30, 45 minutes and just kind of meditated on the great responsibility that I had to lead the legacy of our founder, Wesley John Gaines. And so uh, I, I just felt it very important to go back and pay my respects to our founder. And uh, it, it was a very uh, eye-opening experience and it was just a sense of peace of what I had to do to restore Morris Brown College. And it kind of was like he was speaking to me as I was sitting on this exact bench uh, here at, at the cemetery. Since the founding of Morris Brown College, its graduates have made a profound impact upon American society. And those who've passed through its hallowed halls owe their education to the early leadership and vision of Bishop Wesley John Gaines. In 1929, Atlanta became home to the largest consortium of historically black colleges and universities in the nation, the Atlanta University Center. Historically black colleges and universities have had an enormous impact on not only the history and culture and economics of this city, but of the nation at large. Atlanta has become the progressive city that it is, electing the first black mayor in 1973, I think Maynard took her office in 74, a graduate of Morehouse College. You got your Jose Williams great civil rights leader, one of Dr. King's lieutenant, and a great man in his own right, unbossed and unbought. He is the one that is standing next to John Lewis, 
uh, as they are walking through uh, and across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He is on the front line. He is a Morris Brown College graduate. You got Charles Lincoln Harper, who graduated from Morris Brown, became a great educator, the first principal of Booker T. Washington High School, the public high school in Atlanta, established in 1924, namesake for a high school. He too is a Morris Brown graduate, and the list goes on and on and on, and we can continue to, to celebrate the Honorable Derek Bozeman, former Atlanta City Councilman, great civil rights activist, the Honorable Michael Lankford, former Atlanta City Councilman, uh, one of the great public servants uh, of the city. Uh, the, the list, Donzella James down in the, the State House, all of these are HBCU graduates. And there is nothing like being a part of that experience, being on Morris Brown's campus doing the, the homecoming when all of the alumni come back to meet, greet, to celebrate each other, and to thank God for the opportunity to have matriculated at Morris Brown because of the quality and first class education that we receive. All of this from uh, an idea that was started in a basement in a church. Uh, and, and it's just amazing what happens when vision uh, and dreams take legs. Atlanta, Georgia, the black Mecca, as it has been noted. The city too busy to hate, as it has been said, would not be the city that it was or is or to become if it were not for the schools in the Atlanta University Center and the impact that they all have had on the uh, impact of the economy, of creating a sense of, of good living for middle-class citizens, for politics and government, for education. Were it not for these schools consistently over the last 160 plus years, graduating men and women and moving them into society, uh, many of whom have stayed in the city of Atlanta uh, and have helped to work to make the city the great place that it is. Uh, someone mentioned to me recently when I started the position that if you attended school in Atlanta um, between kindergarten and 12th grade, you were educated by someone who graduated from Morris Brown College, right? That's, that's, that's huge, right? Um, CPAs, educators, religious clergy, I mean, just the, every field of endeavor that you can think of, we have touched this in this city. Um, and, and I think that's critically important regarding uh, how we were founded, regarding how the institution has been able to thrive over the years, even during the unaccredited years, how we've been able to continue to stand and move the, uh, move the college forward and move um, our students and folks who are close to the college forward. I'm an HBCU grad myself. In fact, I'm an Atlanta University Center grad. Um, I'm a Spelman alumna, and I had a conversation just recently with one of my nieces about whether she might want to go to a school like Spelman or not. And one of the things that I said to her was, in 2020, it is still the case that this might be your only opportunity in life to go to a school that was made for you first, that centers your experience, and your cultural context and affirms at every turn your right to be fully human in all of the things that that means. And so it's a really singular important opportunity to develop a sense of yourself and build yourself up in a particular way so that you can take that strength and that self-knowing into your rest of your academic uh, opportunities, the, your future career, the communities that you inhabit and the institutions that you build. And that's what HBCUs do for their students and their alumni um, and those within their orbit 
in terms of the institutions that they build and the work that they do in their communities. Morris Brown College will be the first college in history, first HBCU, to rebound 20 years after losing its accreditation. We're asking all of the community, shareholders, HBCU graduates, anyone, to pour into Morris Brown College financially um, to help us to prove to the transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools that we are financially stable. And so we're asking everyone to pour into the institution. They can go to our website, morrisbrown.edu, click on that Give button and pour in to the institution financially to help us to restore Morris Brown College through the hard reset. For me to be a part of that, it's just an honor. Um, I call it uh, the hard reset, the restoration of Morris Brown College. I cannot let Bishop Gaines down. I cannot let Bishop Morris Brown down. I cannot let down all the individuals who gave up their life to start this institution, to promote and advance this institution. And so right now we're working to become accredited again uh, through the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools. We're going back to our Christian roots of Christian education. And so to be a part of that, to restore the institution, uh, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking, but we're absolutely gonna be able to do it uh, under this administration. Bishop Gaines' significance as an educational and religious leader in Atlanta and across the South cannot be overstated. The legacy of the institutions that he was instrumental in creating not only influenced Atlanta in the second half of the 19th century, but continued to shape the city the region and the nation today. I anticipate Morris Brown College being restored fully. I anticipate us being one of the largest historically black colleges in the city of Atlanta. I anticipate us being innovative, having innovative programming, uh, being able to pour into the lives of future leaders of this country. And I anticipate us doing it very, very soon. Being able to attend Morris Brown is an is a honor to anyone because you're a part of history, you're a part of a legacy. You're part of an organization that is a first. That's another star in Jonah crying, crying a whole, whole Jonah. Oh, oh, Jonah, oh, Jonah, oh, Jonah. Go down to Nineveh, serve the Lord, I want you go down to Nineveh. Serve the Lord, I want you go down to Nineveh.